Um, so it's something completely different this evening. Um, and it's been something I've wanted to do, and I can't do it tomorrow because I've got uh, a bit of a uh, appointment that I can't miss um, at the time that I would normally do a live on a Thursday. So this is your treat. I'm going to do a little bit of something, a bit of a heads up for you so that um, we can discuss it together. Let me just preface this with, I'm quite gutted about this. Um, I'm an idiot, um, I'm sure, that I put any faith into anyone who is a celebrity. And yet, that's exactly what I've done. So um, this live this evening is about Davina McCall and the live that she did on Instagram just a few days ago. It's probably about a week ago. Now, this is a very, this is going to be long because her live is about 50 minutes and I'm going to be talking about it. Some of it I've seen, some of the worst bits I've seen, um, and some of it I'm going to be going through it with you. And uh, the reason I've come to do it this evening is um, I'm quite happy that I found a little way of doing this so that we can watch it together. So let me just say that as a 49-year-old woman, um, I have been really quite ecstatic that Davina McCall has brought the menopause into sharp focus. Um, I think like her fitness videos, I don't know anybody that didn't have a fitness, a Divina fitness DVD. Um, she's on one of my favorite programs, which is uh, Long Lost Family. She's always really um, empathetic. She's, uh, you know, she's She's a woman that you feel that when she does, uh, when she's understanding and lovely to somebody when they're a bit heartbroken or emotional, I feel that that she means it. Um, I also know people who have sort of worked with her on some of the um, comic relief stuff, and she is one of the most lovely people that they've ever met. So there's about four or five people that have met her, and she really is one of the most lovely people they've ever met. And I also remember when she was on Big Brother, when Big Brother was massive and she was pregnant and she had that big T-shirt on Big Mother, which I think might have something to do with why I really like messaging on T-shirts. So I just want to say that I think she's she's been fantastic, um, which is why I think this is completely and utterly um, just... It shouldn't be surprising, but it is. Um, so let's just see what it is that um, Davina McCall have, has done. If you can't hear, do give me a shout and I will sort out my tech. But I think uh, I'm pretty good. Am I on the requests to join? That's not me. That's not me. Um, let's have a look. Um, so, yay! Oh my god, you were so speedy, I love that. Really. Listen, I was ready. I'm gonna just, like, like, put that up a little bit. Light rot. Um, how are you doing? I'm good, I feel like I'm just adjusting to the new year. Like, oh. it was Christmas, there was New Year's, and now we're already here. Um, if any of you play bingo, if any of you do um, TRA, Truny, um, nonsense bingo, uh, if you've got a little card that you want to get out, um, this is going to hit every single one of those boxes. You'll have a full house by about 15 minutes. Yeah. But like yesterday was mad. How are you doing? Oh, I just was like. Like, oh yeah, Christmas, New Year, amazing. And then yesterday happened and it was like 8.30. I started getting the calls and the emails. I was like, I'm not ready. I know, I know. I'm, I'm still avoiding my emails, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm gonna tune back in like Monday. I feel like oh. my soul needs a bit more rest. Well, listen to your body, that's what I say. Yes, listen to your body, woman who's cut her breasts off and calls herself a man. Listen. <laughs> Listen to your body. Um, actually, uh, I, I'm not going to spoil it. I have watched some of this. Yeah. Um, so listen, Kenny, I love you. I want to start off with that. I'm quickly going to tell everybody, tell everybody how we met. We met at a, a talk in Leeds and we were on a panel talk. 
And I think probably at, out of that panel talk, which was so interesting, I feel like we had a moment. I cried. You, you know, you, I, I don't know. I, I feel like we had so much in common. Yeah. Um, and we, we bonded. And ever since then, I've been desperate to get you on this channel to talk about your experience of yeah. being a trans man because you were so eloquent and it was so brilliant to listen to you and I learned so much and I really do feel like I'm a very open-minded person who you know I try and listen to everybody and but I I learned from you and I thought oh I think m my followers would really enjoy like learning from you too so would you just can I just say on that basis uh, when you've listened to this interview, and there's a, quite a few people who have commented quite negatively on Davina's thing, but there was a woman from HR who basically said, I'm so ha happy, I learned so much, I've looked up a lot, I'm taking that straight back to my HR department. So I just want, I just want everyone to be aware, uh, and I'm sure you all are, this is, this is the danger of people who have who are a trusted celebrity, if you like, if if there can be such a thing, um, endorsing this stuff because she will have a lot of influence on women, maybe in their fifties, um, who who sort of trust her that she's done her homework and she wouldn't possibly promote anything that was harmful to women and girls. Just tell me a little bit, firstly, about kind of what you do on Instagram and how you are an activist and what area you kind of work in yeah so i fell into this career by accident a wonderful accident as as the best things in life happen to so um before this i traded stocks and currencies so a completely different field um and i was modeling like on the side because i just i did i viewed models as being very confident people and i was like well if i'm a model i'll just be confident right like that that's just gonna happen obviously that's a really male thing to view to view models is really confident. It's the, the really, <laughs> the really male sort of thing to do. See not how it went, but anyways, was doing the modelling, and then an email came across one day, and it was basically saying that they wanted to do a period campaign inclusive of all people who bleed, and my instant inclusive of all people that bleed. A period campaign inclusive of all people that bleed. Reaction was, you've sent this to the wrong person, like. No way this is for me, this is an accident. Although what they were saying was true, it just wasn't reflective of the conversation we were having in society. It was always based on cis women narrative, cis meaning non-trans. And so I was like, okay, let's just see, let's just have a conversation. Anyways, had a conversation, decided it was the right thing to do, did the campaign and... Uh, for you watching uh, elsewhere, um, Davina McCall is one of our sort of really big TV stars. She's she's in her 50s. She's been on our TVs for a really long time. Um, she is a recovering addict, I think she'd call herself, but she was, an, she was a heroin, I think, and cocaine addict. Um, she talks very candidly about it. She's really, really much admired because she is quite truthful about that sort of thing. Um, she's got three children. She's divorced. She's now married to someone else. I think she's married... Uh, she does quite a lot of um, personal uh, stories, and she's uh, she's a great campaigner for uh, menopause awareness. In fact, one of her recent videos, she said, uh, "Don't wait to get HRT," which is not an irony lost on me um, when she's talking about how it makes you feel better to have the right hormones as a as a as a woman. Five years later, here we are. So. Since then, I've gone on to champion everything that's inclusive for trans people, but ultimately uh, just about making people in general feel at home within themselves and um, acceptance of all people, regardless of walk of life. And I feel like, yeah, trans people are a very marginalized community. And, you know, I just, I wanted to do something for us as well. I think as an, as an older woman, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my mid fifties. You're young, I think don't see yourself as an older woman, don't say that. But as I, I guess a different generation, that's what I'm trying to say. Like I've always kind of thought of myself as quite an open person, but it was only when I did the book Menopausing that I realised that women in their twenty, women of twenty five are going through the menopause, or even sixteen or eighteen. I'm sure she's going to say something like that. Women of girls of sixteen and eighteen are being put through the menopause by having testosterone and and having puberty blockers and and then uh, hysterectomies and so on. She's going to talk about that now. I, come on, 
surely that trans men can go through menopause now i know we're not going to talk about that because let me just say, why wouldn't you think that a woman with a woman's body, with a uterus and a womb and fallopian tubes and uh, women, why wouldn't you think they went through people? Why would you think for a second that they wouldn't go through menopause? Like, how do you get such a disordered mind that you think, what, you think they're actually men? Is that what you're pretending here? Because you haven't really experienced it, so you can't really pass judgment on it. And I think it's important to say I'm not going to ask you anything. I'm not going to ask you to speak on behalf of the trans community, but I just would love to hear your experience of life as a as a trans man. So, but I I spoke to uh, a guy about his experience of of the menopause. Yeah. And I spoke to a guy about his experience of the menopause. To be fair, she could be talking about an AGP pretending that he has the menopause, but I have a feeling she's actually talking about a woman. And I, I, it blew my mind. It was only when I started asking for people to send in their stories. I was like, what, what the fuck? And I felt so, I don't know, I, I just, I felt so embarrassed really that I, I kind of hadn't right. made the effort to kind of learn. So talk to me about how... I was so embarrassed that I relied upon my 55-year knowledge of biology um, to think that you can't change sex. Uh, but now, now that I really did cause um, a negative response from the uh, trans community when I said that the witch trials of J.K. Rowling was worth a listen, um, now that I've said that... Um, my management and I thought it was a really good idea to try and avoid being cancelled by putting me on a panel and now having you on here. Um, Davina, I just want to say to you, you are popular enough and enough women backed you when you did that, that there is absolutely no reason for you to suspend your knowledge and what you actually know about women and bodies and biology and menopause and hormones, etc. You could have been the one, you could have been the person to to lead women, um, it, especially in the celebrity world, who are looking for s- just one person to speak the truth. That could have been you, Davina. But instead, you've gone on a panel and you're pretending that this is, this is your ignorance that made you think that uh, women and women who call themselves trans men are exactly the same things. Oh. Mm-hmm. I guess the first thing I want to know is, as a man, when you bleed, is this not the worst reminder of your biological, who you are biologically, and it's not who you are? I think it ultimately depends on the relationship that you have with your sex. I mean, and what you was assigned at birth. And so for me, when I first transitioned, it was incredibly difficult because it felt like I'm, I'm one way in the world is telling me that I should be another way. No, your body, not the world. Your body is telling you that you're female and in your head you've decided for whatever reason, FYI, she's got a girlfriend or has had girlfriends, uh, for whatever reason you've decided that you're not your body. And I knew from three years old, which is a very common age. I think this is a lie. I don't know it's a lie. It feels like a lie. It feels like a common lie. It feels like, you know, maybe this is the age where some people understand what society expects of them and maybe they don't like it. And maybe there's something to this for this particular person about you can't do this and you can't do that. I don't know. Trans people realise that they're trans, that I was that. And so for me, walking around and saying I'm a boy and going to the toilet with the boys was just just who I was. I didn't think I Apparently using the urinal as a girl. What that that that, my friends, is magic. It was, yeah, it was normal life. It was only as I started to get older and kind of being like, no, you you're not a boy, you must go into the girl boxes where I really started to feel like quite delusional in a sense of why is everybody <laughs> What a coincidence. That's exactly the word I was looking for. What a what a coincidence. Everybody else telling me that I'm this one, I know I'm that. And so that friction of like having that really rattles you as a child because you're already going through so many different things and learning and so yeah it was a difficult time 
But as I got older, um, periods, and I had my first period, I, oh my God, I absolutely hated mm. them. Like, Hands up in the chat. You can just do a number one. One, if you loved getting your period, uh, when you uh, started your periods, uh, like your first period, did you love it? Uh, that's a number one. Or did you hate it? That's a zero. Was it like gross? Did it frighten you? Especially the realization that it was going to happen every month. Just ask him. I hated everything about them. They were really painful for me as well. I used to pass out. My mum used to, I got too big. So she used to be able to carry me to bed. But as I got older, I got, just grew. And she put a blanket on top of me, a pillow under my head and kind of wait until I woke up. And, you know, when we spoke to the doctors about it, you know, their kind of understanding was it's the physical pain as well as the argument that's happening with your head, with your body and who you believe in. Are we honestly saying that a doctor, genuinely a doctor said that it's worse for this particular person because they had some sort of mental anguish that made the period pains worse? you are and so those things happening at the same time at such a young age was incredibly difficult but as I got older I for some people this sounds really weird but I started to see the plus side of having periods because for so long I thought it's this negative thing or you know it's telling it's saying that I'm this person it's saying that I'm a woman and really and truly I'm not and so what ended up happening was as I got older it was like I could connect with women more because I understood what they were going through and I'd have conversations so this woman who pretends to be a man enjoyed enjoyed having periods because she felt she could connect with women more and understand what they were experiencing. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because you're a woman, love. That's why <laughs> because you're a woman. Patients of my sister she's like I hate my period. I'd be like yeah, I don't like mine either. And even my ex-partner as well, she really struggled with uh, I wouldn't say like period shame, but just with some aspects of having a period. And, you know, it's just such a normal conversation with me. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I wash her period underwear. Like, unlike other men who don't get periods, it was, um, you know, it was a real, it was a real plus because, you know, most men, oh, they, they don't have any understanding of having a period. But this, this chap here, uh, he's a special sort of man and he understands periods. He, he has periods, so... Um, he can he can really empathise with women in a way that <laughs> other men can't. But it just really wasn't a thing for me. So I think as I got older, I started to see it as I'm so lucky that I had that experience versus not because I think for a lot of trans people, what ends up happening is you're you're you know you're fighting for trans rights, but you're fighting for me in my case, I'm fighting for a lot of women's rights when I'm talking about trans you are rights. A woman. Because so many issues really and bars cross over, and I think that. When you start to view life like that, it becomes a lot more beautiful rather than putting it on this negative aspect of being like, oh, I wish this didn't happen or I wish I could change these things. And I've just accepted that this is my reality. And This is a woman who sliced off her breast is saying it's much more beautiful if you can just accept that this is my reality. Uh, but I am a man um, and my reality is I have a woman's body, but I am a man. I, I, I just feel that maybe accepting reality is is not this person's forte. What can I do with what I have available today? I mean, what you're talking about is acceptance. And it was interesting that you were talking about the modeling thing and that that's what you were seeking with that. But in fact, <laughs> your journey of activism has like given you like the most amazing healing. Do you, do you? Look, for me, acceptance used to be that you accept what you are. Like, I accept that I'm five foot one. I accept that I wasn't born into money. I accept that I'm as talented or as beautiful or as ugly or as whatever, that that's what acceptance is. Acceptance is not cosplaying being the opposite sex. That's any, that's, that's the opposite of acceptance. Do you talk to, like, do you kind of share a lot with the trans community? your experience because yours is a very moderate kind of balance it feels like such a balanced voice i can totally get on board with everything you're saying yeah. or maybe it's the way you say it i think it's just the way i think to be honest i think um you know especially when i came into being an activist i'll be honest a lot of it's very oh, like trans plus and like we must agree with everything and not have hard conversations and not explore the gray and not like bring formality familiarities between cis women's bodies and trans guys bodies and as 
I, I think I think she means similarities, not familiarities, but it's really it's so funny that there would be similarities between women's bodies and this woman's bodies. Um between a woman's body and another woman's body. I can't it'll come to me. I can't quite put my finger on what those similarities might be or why. I stepped further into this work. I was like, that doesn't that doesn't work for me. Like I, again, acceptance, and actually, I think that that acceptance in myself and talking about reality it is, acceptance leads is. for a lot more acceptance in in conversations. And I think that that ends up just in a better place when we're talking about rights for trans people, about people being able to relate to us. Because you know, there's a lot. I get so many. I'd say deeply personal questions about my body quite frequently. And mm. a lot of it comes from curiosity. I just wanted to How do you like, feel about that? Well, I think it depends where it comes from. Like, I'm always open to conversation. I really like Davina, but uh, this, this kind of, how do you feel about that? Like, this inquiry is very interesting. I'm wondering, is it performative or is it not? Um, oh, it's just... Mm. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? Um, provided that I think it comes from the right place. But for a lot of trans people, it's a hard conversation to have because, you know, you're having such a fight with your body. They, yeah. You might be experiencing it for it. So it really depends on where you are in your own journey of transition and self-acceptance to what level of conversation you can have. I will talk about anything. I really don't care anymore because I've got to a place where I am me. I've accepted who I am. I'm happy with who I am. And nobody else can take that away from me. No conversation is going to change my mind. So mm -hmm. I think that, yes, a lot of growing up, accepting who I am, Except moving it's forward. Acceptance. I feel Everything like there's, what they think. there's a lot um, of also um, naivety or, or the fact that we're all in the dark, basically, cis, cis women around physically what happens to um, a trans man and that some trans men don't, like surgically transition but yeah. you identify as a man and that's um uh, you know the old adage you're like this is what's interesting about this particular conversation and and in a minute that i think they talk about um surgery and so on and there's <laughs> there's some shocking statistics in this but davina doesn't davina doesn't isn't shocked at the the things that i would be shocked at but um this this there's this stereotypical thing like men think with their penis right I mean, men, men's main driver, I would say, is is their penis. And I, I don't even mean that in a bad way. I just mean that it's something that we all accept, that men are very different to women. And one of the things, and I guess it goes back to evolutionary biology, but that's the, that, like, a woman like Kenny is, is not motivated by her penis. And the around testosterone and when do you take that and and how does that affect your body yeah. like you don't necessarily have to talk about yourself personally kenny but i was just wondering like if because i i have worked recently with um a sort of makeup hairstylist and um he was married to a, a trans man who had had tos, top surgery but not bottom yeah. surgery and you know what i was like with, with you kenny i was like ooh. <laughs> just can can I just can you just tell me everything like I'm just really interested yeah and and he, he told he explained to me that that's quite common is that common in your experience as well is it yeah. because it's such a big operation well Davina one of the reasons is because actually there are up to 30 there are cases where there are up to 30 plus corrective surgeries including one to correct urinating out of one's anus um and then there's also fissure fissures um, there's tearing, uh, it doesn't work, there's necrosis. Um, there's obviously like with every surgery, there is a terrible complication that it won't work at all. And then people have their, their pretend um, ripped circle of an arm uh, fall off or sometimes it gets stitched to sort of just below the belly button. Sometimes it's stitched a little bit over to the left or to the right and they don't work and nobody actually can have a penis made because it's quite a complicated um, special little organ um that only grows on a male body but um but i'm look i i shouldn't be talking i'm sure kenny is going to say all about that how dangerous it is and how useless it is and how pointless it is 
So it is. Oh God, this is a big conversation, and, and the first. Don't, thing I, I don't want you to get into trouble. No. Don't say anything. I don't want you to get into trouble with the very accepting or the accepting people that call themselves trans. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just like there's so many different like avenues of this conversation. So the first thing is is that you know, not every trans person wants to have surgery. Ultimately, you know, it's a very personal choice. And a lot of surgical people that have surgery, in, in my case especially, you have it because you're dysphoric. So for me, having breasts was just a no-go. I just knew that that was the case. I've never felt dysphoric about having a vagina. I don't really care. It's not necessarily like I liked having a vagina, if I'm honest, but it's never been something that's really, like, upset me, kept me awake at night, um, I really struggle with. In sexual situations when I'm with other people. And this is the, the very key to this, is the fact that because women are often reduced to our breasts, um, because they are the thing that sort of grows out the front of you that you can see, and you can see men looking at from a really, really young age, that is the link there. Dysphoria is not, I don't believe, genuinely don't really believe in the whole dysphoria thing. I think with anorexics, it's about control. I think with this particular thing, it's about control. It's about being self-loathing. I think it's trying to control the way that people in the world view you and I think that what breasts do is it really does for some women uh, this might be one of them reduces you to breasts um, and so we need to do some big work around this uh, slicing them off is not the answer from partners yes but in a sense of self weight no so uh, that's ultimately where your decision comes from for most people it's is there can I bear this this or do I not have any and that's fine so you know but in terms of like surgery bottom to top surgery um bottom surgery is so top surgery is double more than bottom surgery essentially it's very more common um but the reason why i just want to like go through a side conversation here i don't want people to get caught up in the you know you can only be a man or a woman if you have a certain body type because you can only be a man or a woman if you have a certain body type let me just say do get caught up in that you can only be a man if you have a man's body uh, which means you were born a boy, and you can only have you can only be a woman if you have a woman's body, which means you were born a baby girl. Is what ends up happening is surgery isn't accessible for most people, and so when you're saying, "Oh, well, in order to be a man, you must own A and B body part," then you're actually already giving them a barrier that they might not even be able to pass by. So, if, for instance, GIC, which is the Gender Identity Clinic, which is the trans clinic here in London that you will go to if you are. Um, seeking gender affirming treatment through the NHS currently has a waiting list of what about 14,000 people um, and they're currently only seeing people from 2008 today wow. right so when you're saying well you know if you want to be a man just chop off your boobs and get a penis and call it a day even if you want that to be the case visit 14,000 people let me just say there is a I would imagine there's a disparity between uh, men who have uh, their penises sliced and tucked in and women who have fake penises. And I reckon it also might come down to earning capacity, but it's just me. Physically, not possible. Let's say, okay, you say, I, I don't wait. I can't wait for that. I'm going to seek money. I'm going to find money. I'm going to do go find me, whatever. I'm going to seek family and friends money to do it, right? Then top surgery in of itself is what six and a half thousand on average for the UK, and that's without kind of like any additional stuff that comes with healthcare. That's just the surgery procedure itself. Bottom surgery, phalloplasty, which is the more common surgery for trans men, is seventy five thousand pounds. Oh, okay. I would that, right. Let's just think about that. Let's just think about that because I don't think that. Well, let's just. I'll, I'll let it go and see if they do, but. Are they asking why it would be so expensive? Is it so expensive because there's a massive failure rate? Is it so expensive because it is an extraordinarily complicated, uh, dreadful surgery, but complicated surgery? So okay. when people are just saying, well, just have it, it's like, are you going to give me 75 grand? Yeah, <laughs> no, okay. You see what I mean? So it's a okay. very complex conversation. And there's a number of reasons, for instance, even testosterone. You might not want to take testosterone. I know trans men who are singers and are afraid of their voice right. changing and so they don't take testosterone and also right. you know you just you've got to see it as it's a very individual journey you know some people you know for instance a singer that's a trans guy might turn around and say right i'm not gonna have take testosterone because i'm afraid that it's gonna change my voice but having boobs makes me feel really dysphoric 
And so I'm going to have that done. Do you know what I mean? So you have to I, see I, it. Sorry. No, 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 no. I was going to say it's a very individual journey, essentially, is what I'm saying. I, I have um, a girlfriend who is um, non-binary. Oh, she has a what? Who's non-binary? A what? Mm -hmm. And she's had top surgery. Or they've had top surgery. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I've known her for so long. And um, but it was a wonderful moment when they when they told us because we're all just like, yeah, we know. <laughs> like, what? It was a wonderful moment when one of my oldest friends said she was getting a breast cut off. Yeah, we know. Uh, it's about, just such about a time funny thing. we've been waiting for you. Yeah, yeah, we've been waiting. We've been waiting for you, you to get your breast sliced off. Come on, we've been waiting. We got party poppers and everything. We can't wait. Um, also, we're we're hoping that Johnny down there gets one of his hands cut off. Like we know, we've just known for so long. It, it made so much sense, though. What do you mean it made sense, Davina? What do you mean it made sense to get your breast cut off? What an absolutely preposterous, stupid thing to say. I oh, it was it just made so much sense. Like we've been trying to do things like shut her breasts in the door when she came in. Like we'd we'd cut she'd come round and we'd be like like this with knives, trying to hint to her that it's about time she got those breasts sliced off. Yeah. And um as, and it and Hey, Davina, why don't you go to a um, why don't you go to a ward where women are having their breasts sliced off because they've got breast cancer and just say to them, "Oh my God, it made so much sense. Oh, like we've been waiting. We know. It's so, like my friend had it done. Oh my God, so much joy. It's funny because non-binary wasn't a word. It wasn't a thing. Because it's not a thing. Sorry, because it's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's a stupid, it's not a thing. When, when I was young, but actually I think it is a brilliant description of someone that you just know isn't, is both. It's so interesting. Oh. Out there, I didn't hear anything you said, sorry. Oh, my... I was just saying non-binary wasn't a word when yeah. I was a young girl, but like, actually it's a brilliant description of, and I, I don't, I'm not sure that I properly really understood what it Very, very difficult not to comment. It makes so much sense. It, oh my God, this brand new word makes so much sense. Of course, of course, that person who doesn't fit into all the stereotypes and isn't acting like a pornified version of woman, of course she should be something, something else. Um, of course. It meant until my friend came came out mm. and, and told us that they were, that they were and it made it made complete sense so i was like ah oh, now i know exactly what well, it means let's talk about that mm. so you know for a lot of people non-binary is a very like new concept quotation mark well it was and a new concept not it's new not new at all you know it's mm. just something because of the way that we define gender in western culture it's kind of just been oh i've heard about this i think this is going to be if you've got a bingo card uh get it ready pushed aside ignored mm and left under the rug. But, you know, historically, in so many different countries around the world, non-binary identities have been, you know, existed and, and, and you know. Uh, now what Kenny's going to do is is uh, she's going to list all of those countries and cultures where non-binary, neither male or female, a, a person in, <laughs> in that culture who is neither male or female. Ready, Kenny? Go on, go on. I know, I know she's going to do it. I can feel it. Uh, accepted for ages it was only when kind of colonization happened where there was this one i'm not gonna i'm gonna say the story but please do your research because i know i'm gonna get something wrong but essentially all of it. In certain tribes in america there was a situation where essentially colonization happened and in order to grant them back the property what happened is they said that well you have to have a man of a house and a woman of a house in order for us to be basically bring you into our structure and so that a level was i think assimilation started to happen and so lots of places who lived by non-binary identity mm. ended up being forced into you know male or female and realistically even if 
And also, um, what's really accessible is in some countries, uh, like they literally ate people, like they were cannibals. And um, like with colonization, uh, people stopped, stopped eating each other. So, in order to live authentically, um, I actually have eaten my neighbors uh, authentically. If you look at the science and like sex and like intersex people and all those intersex, things, yeah. there's so many variations of sex that is, you know, it's not binary, but. We've, we've just actually uh what kenny is is a clownfish i don't know if you've heard about that but um in some cultures uh they have like clownfish identities and um rocking horses and uh, uh you can just you can just like really uh be whatever you want it's like like reality said oh let's just put it into two boxes and i think for the most part it's us being an lazy as a society mm -hmm. and also for the control aspect to say that this is a man and this is a woman mm -hmm. and you know what comes with that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's a very mm -hmm. complex conversation and mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's one of those ones that you need to do your research but this is as much as I feel comfortable saying as much as I feel like I can take the research to <laughs> I think Kenny should talk more about those uh countries and uh the land ownership um of um native american tribes uh because i think she's she's an she's a genius absolute genius on this and can i ask you something like is it hard because you're part of a community where there are so many different um oh, um, oh sorry you know i guess in this in, in the cis community like you are man <laughs> in the cis community in the cis community you are the man or woman um and you have sex if you're a man and a woman um and you have a baby but in the trans community um you have jellyfish and pickles is, is that what she's going to say you are woman but in the trans community there are many different people who feel very strongly about many different facets of your community and i, I feel this is a woman treading carefully. This is what treading carefully and not really believing what you're saying might sound like. I feel like, I feel like the power comes from unity. And is it hard when you can feel the fractions sort of splitting off? To some extent, but I think for the most part, you know, it, we're not a monolith. So of course we don't necessarily agree with one another and, you know, we all have different opinions, but we all have the end goal of being more accessible, yeah. society, having the same level of rights. Um, same level as, uh, I really, I, I don't expect she will, but I want to know what level of rights um, in society these people actually want. This woman actually thinks that she wants. You know, having more safety, because that's what a lot of trans people, specifically trans women, specifically black trans women do not have. And so... More safety specifically that men don't have safety to what enter women's spaces kenny what is it that you're saying because you were saying that um it's amazing it's amazing that you understand women uh, amazing um so i'm wondering if that stretches to why you might not want women uh having to share their spaces with men who may or may not want to transition it's really personal it's about acceptance and so if that man who calls himself a woman has accepted his penis and his erections um maybe he hasn't taken any hormones maybe he's just got some fake breasts um and he's accepted that um does that mean that the cis community should accept that man in their space because he's accepted it I, I i just i'm i'm hoping that's what you're saying kenny so, yeah, although there is arguments within any community, I think it's it's all very much like, well, this is, we need to fight for one another. And that's why as well, not even just the trans community, you see more marginalised groups connect with one another on the basis of we're stronger together. Mm. And also more time, mm. a lot of the issues cross over. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And that's why I think what? my career has done so well in the sense that what I talk about and campaign for for five years is about period inclusivity. And at the end of the day, if people want, there are girls and women living in countries right now where they can't have a freaking period without leaving the goddamn house. And you're talking about period inclusivity? Inclusivity? Really?
Holy Mother of God. One, um, you know, period, equality, trans people, non-binary people who bleed have to be a part of that equation. No, you and so when we start to think like that and how you we are, can help each other, it really works. And as you well, like, there's so many different people. Can I just say my husband bleeds? Um, and my sons, uh, if they if they perforate any part of their skin at all, they also bleed. They are not part. I, I am um, absolutely devastated that they are not part of the people who bleed community because I think that should include all, <laughs> all of us. Pieces of research and stuff, there's, there's like inclusivity basically helps like... In countries, for instance, that um, speak in gender terms, so like French and stuff like that, there tends to be less gender equality. Yes, I've got, oh God, I hadn't even... Oh my God, I hadn't even thought that the French are going to find it really difficult to go along with this cult-like language. Oh my God, poor French pretend men and women. I thought of that, I'm... <laughs> Mon Dieu, sacre bleu. French. <laughs> there you go, there you go. So basically, do you see what I mean? And even when, this is another example, um, as you read in the book, it's called Alchemy, um, and it's by Rory Sutherland. And basically he talks about how inclusivity tends to benefit everybody. This is a small example, but essentially saying, you know on the sidewalk when you have the little like ramp that goes down, oh, that's essentially amen, made for amen. buggies and wheelchair users, right? And fundamentally, cool, it does serve that purpose. But actually, do you know who else it serves? People with suitcases on their way to work, on to meetings. Well, I hope you wheelchair users are pleased that you campaigned long and hard so that when I walk with my four-wheeled suitcase that I can use a, the ramp in the pavement because I'm sure that was part of the reason that you campaigned for disability rights to actually access the world in which you live. So it's on to busy things. And so even like, for instance, um, subtitles, you know, when you're in a pub, a busy pub, and you want to watch a football game and you've got the subtitles underneath, although it's made for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, it also benefits those who are fully able. Do you see what I mean? And so at the end of the day, it's like mm. inclusivity mm. actually does benefit everybody. Oh my God. But I think so poignant. inclusivity requires us yeah. to think more deeply, requires us to change. Look, I take it back. This person is a genius, philosophical genius. Like, oh my God, how did I, how did I doubt the majesty of such a woman? Our systems, and for the most part, I think a lot of people struggle with that. And also, we're in an economy where money's tight, and a lot of these, it, it's going to take money to fund all of these changes. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we're in a place where we're having better ideas, and you know, there's more intersectional conversations happening, all these wonderful things. But it's just taken a while, and that's frustrating as somebody who cares about inclusivity in this space, but. Yeah, I think it's just, we're better together, stronger. We need, to think, so about, we need to think about e each other. I so agree. Um, just, there are, there are actually um, adult changing spaces um, that women um, and men who have profoundly disabled relatives who are too big for baby change, who, who want to go out. Um, and... <laughs> It's so beautiful because now men with nappy fetishes can be included and they can also go out and take photographs of themselves in those adult spaces. Um, and uh, it's, it's so beautiful that they get to benefit from the hard work of people with like really difficult lives who may not have had a night's sleep for about three years, but now that Men with a nappy fetish can also use those spaces. Um, that's what inclusivity is is actually all about. Care for one another. I think when I have conversations with people and they say, how can I be an ally? The number one thing I say before anything else is have empathy for other people. Mm. That's the first thing. Do you know, Davina, do you know, do you know why I loved you before I met you, but I was so glad that you proved me right? It was the fact that you was intrigued every single person that you met. You want you gave you 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 asked you asked deeper questions you you pay them attention and I feel like and that's why Davina's next guest will either be me or a detransitioner because she's so she's just so curious she's so curious to get the 
like all sides of the argument. She's so curious. That's what we we all love about Davina. That makes you especially a great ally, but everybody else can learn from you in that sense. Like it's just about having a genuine curiosity for how I can help mm. you and how you can help me. Mm. And that is just well, the foundation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That That's was so nice. nice. Mm. Um, I wanted to talk to you because it's quite funny because I take testosterone um, because my testosterone levels were low and it's very, very hard for women to get in this country. Um, Oh, what's that, Davina? It's very hard for women who need it, who are going through the the, <laughs> the menopause. It's very hard to get testosterone. Why? Why would that be? We've got fourteen thousand people waiting for surgeries at Gids. Um, it's, it's tricky. Uh, I can't work it out. Why would it be that women who need a little boost of testosterone to help them actually get through quite a tricky time in the sort of the female lifespan? Um, and there's loads of girls that pretend to be men taking something. No, can't work it out. Can't work it out. Who are struggling with low testosterone but don't need a lot. We just need a tiny weeny amount, but they don't have female testosterone. So we take men's testosterone. So we have the little sachets and instead of taking a sachet a day, you know, I make it last kind of two and a half weeks, but then somebody else who might need a bit more than me might try. But um, it, it, it really made me feel a lot better. And now she's going to connect the dots. Shall we cross our fingers? I'm not going to bloody hold my breath. Like, I can't, I can't tell you. And it wasn't just about libido, because people always talk about um, testosterone in terms of libido. And look, it, it, it helps a bit, but it's, it's so much about clarity, focus, energy. Um, it was like the final kind of missing piece of my, my brain kind of came back. I and I just wondered what it was like. How did you get testosterone? Is that the first thing? Obviously, She just went to the doctors and said, I think I'm a boy. And the doctor just went, let me just sign. Let me just give you a prescription of something that's going to limit your life, increase your... Uh, risk of heart failure, also increase your risk of Alzheimer's because you'll go through the menopause early and that might cause vaginal atrophy, which will actually lead you into a situation where you're in so much pain once you've had an orgasm that your body just crunches up like that and, and it doesn't let go and it can leave you in hours of pain. And the only the only way of getting rid of that pain is to have a hysterectomy, which obviously then increases your risk of Alzheimer's. Um, it increases your risk of chronic uh, fatigue, it, it increases your risk of chronic anxiety, increases your chances of having heart failure, heart disease, uh, palpitations, um, and so on. Oh, and cancer. But um, how did you get it? So you get lots of counselling. and But when they start saying, okay. Let why do you gloss over it? Why not ask? Do you get lots of counselling? Because they don't, Davina. They don't. So your assumption there to all of your followers is, is completely based on something that you hope, but it's not true. Let's do this. <laughs> is testosterone the first step? And what's it like? Oh, God. Um, testosterone changed my life. I am so much happier because of testosterone. But Davina has just said that testosterone changed how she felt. Like tiny, tiny doses of testosterone changed how she felt. Didn't give her facial hair, didn't change her voice, just tiny, tiny dose um, in order to make her feel whole again because uh, that's what happens in menopause. I don't know why menopause is so bloody cruel, but for some women it absolutely is. So, uh, God. The fact that she's connecting no dots is really annoying me this far. I was going to be a little more generous. I don't feel that generous. But um, in terms of how that process works, so I came out uh, as being trans when I was 11 years old, came home to my mum, didn't have the language of what to say, so I was just like, just kind of like screamed it to my mum. I was like, mum, I don't see myself as a girl of a girl. I see myself as a boy with a girl. And being an incredible mom. Oh, like a tomboy. It's so, oh, like a, like a tomboy. That's what you would say to your daughter, isn't it? Mum, I don't see myself as a girl of a girl. I see myself as a boy of a girl. Oh, that's okay, because you can be any sort of girl. Nowadays, we're really lucky that, that people have sort of thought that you don't have to be a stereotypical kind of feminine girly girl you can be any sort of girl and you're still a girl and it's just as valid and it's fine so 
Oh, that isn't that nice? Well, she was. She was like, okay, let's talk to a doctor. That was like. Literally Did she perfect. know? She, she. I think her and my older sister was under the assumption that I was a lesbian, which was a very That's fair true. assumption for the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think had they understood more about trans people and transness, I think they would have made the assumption that I was trans. But you're talking. I'm what twenty nine now, so you're talking ages, years, years ago, where you know the popularity around understanding what trans is didn't exist. Like. Yeah. I, I grew oh, up really with no trans role models. Like the closest I had to a role model was Tracy Beaker. And she's not trans or anything. She was just a bit of a mischief and like people didn't really understood her, understand her. And I could relate to that story. I don't even but like there was just no between. Um, so yeah, I came out when I was 11 and I did counseling for about eight years, um, which is a bit of a prolonged journey. But the reason being at that time, I don't feel like there was a proper structure for transition like versus what exists today. Um, so, it was very much of a figuring it out. Yeah, it was... I'm gonna ask you something because this is, and this is a bit of a contentious issue, but I am interested in your journey. Yeah. Are you pleased you had that eight years or would you have loved it to have been a bit sooner? Wait, Were you sure. damaged emotionally by waiting? Yeah, 100%, 100%. Oh, like... oh my God. Hey Davina, why don't you just tell everyone that you'd like children to transition? Jesus H. Oh. Jesus Christ. Would you would you have liked to have uh, eradicated your body of everything? Um, like when you were eleven, like would that have been great? There gets to a point where you're not you're doing me a disservice or any trans youth by not allowing them to transition. And transition doesn't necessarily mean testosterone. Transition in some way can be social transition, it can be hormone blockers which are reversible. Um they See, look, uh, ju just so much shit in this. So much that's completely wrong. It's really irresponsible. Davina McCall, you probably won't watch this. You probably have never heard of me. Um, but I'm just going to say to you, what you've done is really fucking irresponsible. It's really irresponsible to let these lies go. It's really irresponsible. They're just going to hit the pause button on your PBE to buy you some time to really have that consideration. So essentially, that's what ended up happening. It was like seven years of therapy, um, me getting to a point of su suicidal thoughts and, and really like feeling the pain of not being able to. Like literally, it was, it was very much like this either happens or life stops here for me. And it was becoming very obvious with my mom and my family. And, um, you know, we went to the doctors and we said how severe it was. And my dysphoria was only getting worse because... I think the thing is, it's not because you're not, it's not an isolated. Because once you fixate on something that you need to change about the way you look in order to move through, in order to be better, then that will be the thing. Look, let me just tell you about, no, uh, uh, just very quick. I just want to, I just want to put this into perspective why this makes sense to me when I say that focusing on that one thing, the biggest indicator in a woman needing a cesarean and failing to have a natural birth. The biggest indicator, now I've had four cesareans. I'm not like a pro natural birth person. I think however you get your baby out safe and alive is the best way for you. I couldn't really care. I don't care about women who I think good for you. If you think that having a pain-free, um, you know, a, a, a a drug-free birth is the best thing that you can do for your baby. Go you, whatever. I, I, I just make no judgments about this at all. However, it is scientifically proven, it is fact, that if you think that you won't have a successful vaginal, vaginal labor, that is the biggest kind of differentiation between you having one and not. That's the biggest vari uh, variable, sorry, between having a safe vaginal birth and not. Um, so I just want to say that it is it is perfectly logical that if you think your breasts are making your life very, very difficult and you've decided that your breasts are making your life really difficult and impossible to live with, um, then that will become something that you focus on massively as something that, that absolutely needs to change. And the fact that you formulate that sort of thinking um, in your early teens, and that stays with you, um, is totally that you've had shit counselling. That's that's all that means. Experience. I'm also seeing all of my guy friends grow facial hair, become six foot, and I'm growing in the completely opposite direction. So that feeling of like becomes more intense over time as your body starts to develop very differently from 
the gender it's that you are under. And so it's that, that as you get older, that pressure that you're one. feeling becomes worse and it just becomes harder to hold. Mm. You think about it more often. It's just mm. a lot. And so by 17, I had basically reached a breaking point and, you know, told my mum, we urged the doctors and the doctor said, okay, well, we'll put you on blockers, which is PBE blockers, which is uh, essentially just the pause button for PBE. Um, and so I took that for a year and then, the, and then a the glorious day came where they said, you can take testosterone. That, and I when you were 18? Ran, and yeah, and I literally ran to the hospital. Ran to the hospital. <laughs> like, ran to the, I mean, I got off the bus and then I ran to the hospital, but I was so excited because, you know, for me, when I started testosterone, I would say that's where my life began for me. You know, I had a very good... There are people in the chat saying they, they you know, they have compassion for her, and, and I would. But she's 29 and she's selling this shit to children. Uh, as is Davina now, because Davina will convince some, there might be mothers who follow Davina, um, whose child or children or son or daughter um, is saying that they are the opposite sex. And now Davina's given those parents the green light um, to go along with that. So in my mind, Davina becomes partly responsible for a young woman sterilizing herself um, or being medically harmed by transition or, or worse, a mother imposing this upon a child that maybe just doesn't fit into whatever stereotype that mother has in her head for her child on based upon sex. So it's not just advertising something. It really is becoming partly responsible, potentially, for some really, really catastrophic harm to a minor. Childhood, you know, very much be who you are. And then puberty came, stole everything from me. And then testosterone came, was like, right, I'm reclaiming, this is my life again now. How long before you, before you started noticing a difference and were you excited? Uh, I would tell you like the next day, nothing actually happened, obviously, but in your head, in your head, you're like, oh my God, like, yeah, because it's not real. Yeah, like, basically, <laughs> yeah, you think it's, there's a massive difference. There wasn't, there was absolutely nothing. It was just, it was no, it was the, it was the mental aspect of knowing that the changes were coming that made it easier. Because at this point, you're not waiting any longer. Do you know what I mean? You know that it's just a waiting game now for how your body's going to develop in a way that aligns with who you are. And so I remember coming out thinking like I was the Hulk. Obviously, there's no changes. My butt hurts from the injection because that's where you have it done. Aside from that, I was just happy. You know, I was just happy. And then in terms of actual physical changes, it was probably about three months when my voice started to drop, um, which obviously kind of like carried on for about five years. And then wow. I would say about two to three years where it's like sideburns, thick, thick tash. Like, I'll never forget when I got my first facial hair, right? Got my first chinny chin chin hair. And I go to my mum, I say, mum, I said, mum, look, it's finally happened. It's finally happened. Do you know what she turned around and said to me? She goes, I can put that in my eye and shut it. I was like, excuse you. Do you know how excited I am right now? She's just taking the piss. Do you know how excited I am? I think Kenny's forgot to uh, do mannerisms like a bloke. She really is not doing well. I'm right now, mum. And she's obviously just being a loving mum and just winding me up. But yeah, there was years of changes and then it was about five years um, for like beard to fully connect. And then now, what, I'm a 11 years and there's all of this. And all of this is very much everywhere else as well. <laughs> very hairy. Have you had any regrets ever? No. 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 Like... I think they say it takes about 15 years to regret. I think I think that becomes a toll on the body. Um, but she's not the only one, is she, that, that does this to her body and, and many people regret it. I And this is me being honest with myself yeah. as well as you. No, yeah. like, never. There's, I've always kind of questioned after top surgery, if I wanted bottom surgery, would it be the right choice for me? Uh, or having like you know, jaw fillers and things like that, more gender affirming treatments I've always considered and been like, I'm not into Because nothing says acceptance like considering getting fillers. Sure, but the fact that I'm Kenny and I'm a man, 
never not once mm -hmm. like even when i started to do a lot of research because i was being in this space one i wanted to be able to argue with counter arguments so i started reading anti-trans stuff and like it's hard as a trans person to read that but i knew that my strength as an activist would be knowing what argument would come to me so i did research and like a lot of that is very hard mentally to 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 battle with what the truth I know it's t very difficult. See, I can listen to all of the pro mutilation arguments, um, and it's not hard for me. It's it's more difficult to understand that other people believe it, um, or pretend they believe it, or are prepared to harm children on the basis of it, or young women confuse vulnerable young women and men. Um, but it's not hard to read the truth, Kenny. In what way? And because a lot of it is like, you know, they're trying to, a lot of this evidence is trying to believe you of like, well, you know, gender and sex only aligns in one way. And that's basically cis people, non trans people, and it doesn't exist the other way. And they'll provide, you know, countless evidence of why this isn't the case. And I'll read it and you second guess yourself for a second because it sounds so official, you know. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm I'm really struggling with the consistent kind of misuse of words um, because um, this woman doesn't doesn't seem to know where to use the right words. But I'm trying. I'm gonna I'm gonna gloss over that. Um, it sounds official. I think she means it sounds plausible. Um, and the reason it sounds plausible is because it's true. Uh, let me just say as well. I I really don't believe in gender. I think there are sex roles. And there is biological sex and we are expected to behave and do things on the basis of our biological sex. And often our biological sex informs that expectation. And then there are other things on top. Like There is no reason that, that I should be better at vacuuming my house than my husband. In fact, I'm not. Um, so some of those things are very different, but, but I think there is a, there is a biological basis for some of the, um, expectations on how we will behave or the role that we play um, as men and women. But, Jesus. So this doctor is saying this and this person is saying that. I know it must be true. And so you're like, is it true? But mm -hmm. it can't. Is it true that because, <laughs> is it true that because I have a vagina and breasts are growing and I've ovaries and a womb, that I am a woman? Like, is that true? Is it true that because I've got a vagina and a vulva and breasts and a female skull and female DNA and, and everything female, is it true that I'm actually a female and therefore I can do anything that any other female that's ever come before me that can do and maybe some other things. Is that true? It can't be true because I know what's yeah. in my heart is that's, true. Yeah. So it's like fighting that feeling and just being like, no, I actually don't believe that. And mm. there's so much more evidence to show. That, my friends, is cognitive dissonance. Um, give her a round of applause for cognitive... Oh, this is what she heard when she read... When she was like, no, is that true? And then I said to myself, no, because I, I, this is what she heard. The truth. The truth. The truth. Don't listen to the truth. So that trans people can and, and should exist versus not, you know? There's so much. Even I did research the other day. I was talking about the fact that um, plants are queer in the sense that there's so many different plants. They can change sex to be able to develop other plants. All these Plants are queer. I've got a really, really pervy AGP cheese plant in my lounge. Different wonderful things like we are, trans people are just a natural reflection of what, of what humanity is mm -hmm. and what, of what, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Nature yeah. is. Mm -hmm. And Tell you what, I've got a bisexual spider plant. Jesus Christ, rabid. Yeah. And how long, how long was it when you started to, like fully kind of embracing your manhood and were able to be kind of really out for, for people to properly gender you as a man? Like you weren't being misgendered. It was like, yeah, yeah Kenny, like, Ooh. and then, and then what about girls? What about what? Like, when did like you start, girls? when did, when did girls start kind of, 
<laughs> we're to be like, we're going uh, here. We're going here. Oh right. God, it's so much fun. So much fun because, oh, I'm just such a nice person. Right, so, right, first question. What's the first question? So the first one was like, how how long was it before you kind of went full? How long was it before you thought, oh, I'm just not getting misgendered? Okay, so when I became cis passing, is the What's phrase that? you're looking for. What's that? Cis passing means that you. Um, oh, cis passing. Are being... cis pass as a cis man. Yes. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So people see you as the gender that you identify as, and so I became cis passing probably 25, 24, mm -hmm. solid, the no questions. Weird. No matter what room I walked into, early twenties, there was still such, like I was, I was always, I was always more passing than I wasn't because, to be fair, I always looked pretty much like yeah. a boy. The thing is, wasn't there wasn't much of a difference sure. when I transitioned aside from the facial hair developed, to be honest, and getting my breath cut. Yeah, but that wasn't a big difference. Yeah, yeah, my voice is definitely very. I'm, I'm very content. I'm all my transitional aspects. I'm very, very content with my voice. Mm. So I'm very lucky. And in terms of girls, when girls came into the picture, I was, I was probably like, I think it was about 17 when I had my first girlfriend. Um, she was bi. Okay. So helped in the sense of like, you know, that she blurry can't. line of transitional stuff. It didn't really matter to her because she was attracted to people of both sexes, if you yeah. were to use the phrase. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was fine. Like but, you know, that was when the, I really started to kind of experience another level of dysphoria because it was no longer just about how I felt to myself. It was how I felt in reflection of being with others. Because I think... It... What do you mean? So it's... It's not about how I am to myself in myself, personally to myself. It's also trying to con someone else to not talk about the things that I want to control. It's very much like when you're by yourself and you're in isolation and you think about your body, you, I don't know, I just kind of... I don't necessarily feel this for it because I have no comparison. It's just who oh, I am versus, see, when yes, I, yes. versus when I was with women. It's like, well, me and you have a lot of the same body parts. And that kind of made me feel a little bit more dysphoric. And so that took years of like therapy and working through and being like, it's a oh my God. So she was actually transphobic once she started having sex. What, like the, the body that she'd ruined um, by taking testosterone and, and having her breast cut off. Um, when she was actually with a woman who hadn't done that, she was dysphoric. I wonder what other words we might use instead of dysphoric there. Okay, so I have a similar body. I'm not the same person, you know? We're not the same gender. And so, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was difficult. You've got a vagina. <laughs> I've got a vagina. You've got a vulva. I've got a vulva. Uh, you've got ovaries. I've got ovaries. We both have periods, but we are not the same gender. Like, we are not the same. I'm not the same person. What, as someone else? No, you're not. Because that would be uh, impossible to be the same person as someone else. Cool. Um, having relationships with women, having, specifically having sex with women for a long time. But um, I've been lucky and very fortunate in the sense that my partners have always been really loving and understanding and supportive. And, you That's know, even mean. when I couldn't afford um, like a chest binder, one of my exes would help me put wraps around me, which is basically what helps you oh. give like a flat chest uh, look for anyone who doesn't know. One of my exes would just like wrap my chest. So yes. like I've always had really wonderful people. You know, my last ex really helped me with my career today in terms of like helping me to become more eloquent, bringing up my writer's skills. Jesus Christ! And well, no wonder, no wonder she's an ex. If um, if she helped you be more eloquent, you, well, you've got rid of her. Making me feel more at home in my body. And so, yeah, I've just been really lucky in terms of, yeah, I've just got really loving people. Um, you know, yeah. with, with physical posture, because you were just talking about physical posture there or, or binding and how, you know, your breasts become like um, like a kind of weight or like a something you just kind of want to hide them. <laughs> that must have an effect on your, even if, even if they're kind of hidden, you're just constantly trying to you know lean forwards. So there's a funny thing. So oh, interesting. Also, it? I can say this, although I shouldn't. But this is between you and I and everyone who's watching. So I just, I just finished writing my first book, and how to bind. Thank you. And one of the stories okay. um, in it is basically talking about how my posture changed after transition or tummy top surgery specifically. Because what you do is naturally you're leaning forward so you can hide your chest. Yes. And can I just say how many girls, how many women do you know do that? How many girls did that at school the whole time? 
not girls that thought that they were boys, but just generally speaking, loads of girls do that to hide themselves. Honestly, this, these people are so narcissistic and they think they're so special and different and unique. Let me just tell you one thing you look. I always tell my children that they are special to me. I don't tell them they're special because they're not. Because they're, they're part of 8 billion people on this planet. Now, I love them very, very much. But I don't expect the world to like them or love them at all. I expect them to, to earn their place in the world as decent people, which means people will like them. That's why we teach our children manners. That's why we teach our children consideration. That's why we uh, uh, stop our children being narcissists, self-absorbed, selfish people, thoughtless. That's what we do as parents. It seems to me that often a lot of these women that pretend that they are men think that the whole world revolves around them and that the way they feel about something is so utterly unique and special. It's really not. And so, and also, but that's just not good for your mental. Do you know what I mean? You want to stand so you want to sit up high and straight. So being I'm like that- proud. Was, you, exactly. So punching in of itself, like there's so many different things that, you know, that's- Not too, not close after the surgery, because obviously you've got loads of healing to do once they do massive, great big deep incisions in your chest and remove your healthy breast tissue. So you're not, you're not doing that straight away. You might have to wait quite a long time. In fact, you can't even put your arm up. For weeks and weeks and weeks. It's a part of transition that you don't think would affect it because that affects you how you feel in your day to day. Because if you're naturally yeah. just all the time, that's how you energetically are. So, yeah, I'm glad. Listen, so glad I got top surgery. I had top surgery when I was. So glad that I got my breast cut off. I'm so glad that they're healthy breasts um, that you know, we're just amputated. That was such a great thing. It was such a, it's so good that when I started having sex with women and looking at their bodies with breasts, it, it, it made me go into years of counseling, but it was so good to have my breast cut off. So good. Um, totally didn't regret it at all. And the counseling that I had to have because some women had breasts who I was having a sexual relationship with, um, you know, it, uh, that was just natural um, and just totally affirmed that I'd made the right decision. 19, so testosterone was for a year, then top surgery was 19. And then I've had um, just jaw filler since, but I haven't had bottom surgery. Or like mm. a hysterectomy or anything like that. Mesectomy, mesectomy? Yeah. Mesectomy. Yeah. Really yeah. I forgot what the word is. Um, when you have your hysterectomy. Yeah, that's the one. I haven't had that done. But considering as I get older. I think, in interestingly, if you... I mean, you'll need to come and talk to me after that. Um, yeah, because if, if you do, and you, if you have your ovaries... Does she not know that once you have testosterone, um, you can go into menopause? And knowing what she knows... This is, this is, I think, quite sick. Knowing what she knows about um, menopause... And the other day she did a video, and I think I mentioned it at the, at the beginning. The other day she did a video saying, don't wait. If you're thinking about HRT, don't wait. Because it really could make such a difference, right? Why would she, even for a second, when somebody mentions hysterectomy, why would it be, <laughs> oh my God, you have to come and see me, um, when you do so much um, harm to your body that you go into menopause in your sort of mid-30s. <laughs> Oh my God, come and see me. Oh, that would be so great. Oh, that's really interesting. It's so interesting that women that I'm talking to in their mid 50s about menopause and how uh, extraordinary it is. And it's really like quite hard. And I've, I've done so many programs about it. It's, um, it's something I'd like you to do in your mid 30s. And we can like laugh about it. It'd be so great. We can bond, cry and bond. Removed, um, which would probably be part of a full hysterectomy. Um, then that would plunge you into the menopause. And then actually, you know, when I talk to this friend of mine, the guy whose husband is a trans man, but has just had the top surgery. And I was just talking about the menopause yes. with somebody else in the room. And he went, I think, I think my husband. Oh, my husband I'm very close with. He's a trans man who's just had her breasts removed, my husband. Um, I think... He might be going through the menopause. We're so close that we haven't actually talked about it. Menopausal. Mm -hmm.
but actually you do need a bit of support like you need a bit of support you need looking at your hormones you need to kind of get yourself balanced because but then the other problem with that which have a hysterectomy and then take some estrogen Mm, that'd be great i think is a very difficult thing Mm. is that it means in order to keep yourself sane or look at your bone density Mm -hmm. and look at your brain health and your heart health that would involve taking estrogen which is basically counterproductive which is counterproductive (laughs) so i think this is something again that's that's kind of interesting i mean look we we know so much like women are so well treated with the menopause why don't you split your menopause time davina into women that force themselves into the menopause do that do that don't worry about us us old cis women with our old-fashioned menopause just just help this just help women that get their breasts cut off, take hormones and plunge themselves into menopause. Why don't you focus on them now? Oh, my God. So interesting. It's just so interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I didn't know more about it. We'll have to look at. Like, we'll have to be. Well, this is, you know what? I find it, you know, when, when we were talking about this before, you were saying about your, your friend uh, having menopause. You know, it's so funny thing is like. Hilarious. Healthcare is so underfunded when it comes to trans people and so there's and- so much. Ah, so- oh, it's massively funded with menopause. Massive. Oh, my God. I, do you know what? I went to the doctors and I said I might be perimenopausal. Do you know what they did? They basically went like this. They were like, why don't you have 500 quid? Get yourself some Get yourself some hormone. Get yourself some serotonin. Why don't you just, oh, my God. Why don't you, look, we've got, we've got menopause clinics every week. Come along. My friends with endometriosis. Oh, my God. They get treated so, it's just, it's just swimming in money for women so much. women yeah women 100 percent. women first, like, oh, then, uh, no i mean it's not first but i'm no. just saying it's no like, it's, it's crazy not, it's like no. all all the research has been done yeah cis men but this is this is the issue when it comes to trans healthcare because it's like well nobody knows right it's like a mystery it's yeah, like i've shit. always said that i felt like a lot of my transition for the most part has been guesswork in the sense that when I'm asking doctors, doctors don't have answers. And whenever they do have answers, some of the time they're wrong. Their answers are, you've got borderline personality disorder and a really bad dose of narcissism. And if you could just pull yourself together and actually accept who you are, we wouldn't have to waste our time worrying about getting sacked because we don't want to go along with your delusions. Wrong. So for instance, again, very personal. I'm sorry if anybody's like scared of this kind of language, but it's fine. Um, But essentially... Basically, when I started taking testosterone, they tell you that a side effect is that essentially your vagina won't become as wet because it tends to dry you up. Yes, I said, that's okay, what cool. happened right. to the guy in the... Oh, my God. Um, really? What, you take testosterone and then your vagina doesn't work? Oh, my God. I, look, unlike most of the doctors, I seem to really understand what's going on. Oh, no, I understand as much as any doctor because... It's all bullshit. It's all untrue. It's absolute not true. Oh, the doctor's like, when I say to the doctors, what will happen if I take testosterone for 20 years? Uh, What will happen? The doctors are like, we don't know. Why don't we know? Because it's not supposed to happen. Look. Right. Mine is the opposite. So, like, I'm more wetter now prior to taking testosterone. Definitely more wetter. Thank Christ he got rid of that ex-girlfriend who uh, who um, told him uh, how to be more eloquent. Well, that's really exactly. interesting. Exactly. And so when the doc- when I and then I went back to the doctor and I told the doctor the opposite has happened. The doctor was like, "Oh wow, okay, like, like science, science." And the doctor said, "Why are you telling me? I couldn't really care less." That's what the doctor said. It basically suggests that that should be happening, but it's not with you. And I said no, and then I spoke to a few of my trans friends, and some said the same thing. Like, I think that- that's just the ones that didn't have heart failure. I mean, some of them, some of them find themselves completely and utterly dry. Um, you know, with the with the heart failure. The thing is, it's like we just don't. Yeah, we don't enough research there even for instance like i think i told you this when i when i met you about me having my eggs harvested for my sister so that uh, process of fishing oh, will you... starts... <coughs> please because that's such a yeah. big thing please will you tell yeah oh good donor conception as well 
Oh, that's so nice. So she's eradicated, uh, you know, absolutely poisoned her own body with testosterone. But thank God she's had her eggs harvested so that there can be a baby created with her genetic material given to her sister who may get that fertilized with someone she probably doesn't know, have it implanted, and then the little girl, boy growing up can look at supposed Uncle Kenny, um, can look at her uncle who actually provided the genetic, the maternal genetic material, um, and her mum won't be her own, and maybe she doesn't know her dad. Oh, my God, that's so sweet. That's so... Well, how touching is that? Yeah, of course. So, basically... I have a sister, um, her name's Kizzy, I love her to bits, and she has been trying to become pregnant on her own for a while. And Well, you'll never do it on your own. I think that's Kizzy's probably first mistake, that if you're actually trying to get pregnant on your own, <laughs> it's very unlikely to happen. ...has really struggled. And we were jokingly have a conversation one day, and I was like, oh, well, you can have my eggs. And she was like, do you have eggs? And I was like, I think I should. Like. Well, surely I'm not having periods. Like, there's a, I haven't had any surgery. It should be there, right? And so we just we kind of put a conversation to the. They are so well informed. Um, of course, they've made all their decisions with um, so much information that uh, you none of you can worry about this. Besides, and as um, her journey was going on and trying to become pregnant and just wasn't working, she got serious and was like. But you give me your eggs? I said, absolutely. <laughs> you can 100% have them. And so, yeah, we had a conversation with a doctor. And this was two years ago. So listen to the, even the changing conversation. Oh, thank goodness. I thought it was going to be when she hadn't taken testosterone. But thank God she'd taken about 10, uh, nine years of testosterone by then for those eggs. Because uh, I, I was beginning to worry that those eggs would have no testosterone um, throughout uh, their genetic material. So thank, thank goodness for that. So two years ago, went to the doctor, says, you know, I want to basically essentially pause testosterone in order to essentially go down an IVF process to harvest my eggs, give them my sister and basically keep a little pot for myself. That was the plan. That was a conversation we had two years ago. And then I had a conversation with... Because I'm planning, what I'm planning on doing is actually gaslighting my own uh, offspring as well. Uh, so that's nice. NHS again last month. And now, fascinatingly enough, you don't actually have to come off testosterone to get eggs harvested. Right. Yeah, right. Really, they don't actually know that it's harmful or not harmful. They don't know. Because like everything, doctors just don't know. But, but fuck it, I've done it anyway. So, yeah. So uh, you can just do that. So you can... You can <laughs> You can have your eggs harvested, which includes a, lo a bag of hormones that are really quite damaging to the female body, which is why IVF is actually really quite damaging, especially multiple rounds of it. But if you want to pump your body full of ho female hormones um, as a female and take testosterone at the, at the same time, it's a bit like mixing a tramadol and codeine, I've heard. So even the knowledge of two years ago has changed because basically what they said is um, essentially so women have PCOS is what they're based yep. on tend to have more eggs in their egg reserve because of the high level of testosterone in their body right so they're basing that on our experience of being like because it's exactly the same a woman with polycystic ovary syndrome is exactly the same as a woman who's taken synthetic testosterone for a decade it's exactly it's exactly the same and you're transphobic and terrible cisphobic and transphobic if you say it's different at all well your anatomy is a certain way and you know you're taking them x amount of testosterone so we we're not saying it's completely correct but this is the evidence that we have similar for someone in we're not saying it's completely correct but fuck it this is the evidence that we've got um it's uh three sheets of a4 and uh some trans inclusive uh academic um who is non-binary uh, we never know what they are when they come in uh, but they've written uh, three sides of a4 um on exactly why they think it's okay to uh, harvest the <laughs> harvest the eggs when a woman's absolutely poisoning herself with testosterone. So, you know, we don't know it's all right. Like, we're all guessing, but, you know, um, yay! Clownfish or something. Um, clownfish do it. And um, there's some Indian tribe that before colonization did it. 
uh, they would harvest their eggs. Um, and because of colonization, they stopped harvesting eggs. So we're just, we're just doing that. In any way of your situation. And so they basically just suggest that you reduce your testosterone um, just to, just because that's kind of what's more do Reduce it to semi-poison levels. Documented. It's not that you can't, I could continue my journey now on the same level of testosterone, but they can't. I continue my journey without testosterone. I, 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 I use petrol. Petrol works for me. Then predict what the outcome is because they have no science to suggest it, basically. Mm. And so, yeah, we're going to move forward with that literally next month. Um, to my oh, yeah. next yeah. month oh yeah, my literally. god that's so exciting you're gonna have some some poison testosterone poisoned eggs and they're gonna be hot oh my god i'm so that's so great you've got an appointment i think it's the 28th of next month so i'm really excited she is because i was really like worried about coming off testosterone because you know I just imagine. The, the mental I imagine. Do you know yeah, what I mean? it would be well it would be very hard Obviously, very hard physically, but mentally really difficult, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm just, you know what the thing is? Well, Davina's obviously an ex addict. She came off heroin, so uh, she knows exactly what that feels like. I wouldn't come off testosterone for long enough for there to be a massive physical difference because you're talking about coming off testosterone for six months worth of, versus 11 years worth of yeah, all yeah, of this. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, there yeah. wouldn't be a dramatic effect, but nevertheless, mentally and like, even yeah. distribution of body fat and like going to the gym and all those kind of things would be, and just your hormones doing that switch mm. would be. Just like your body that you'd really accept, really, really, really accept um, doing its thing, you know, accepting that body that you accept at doing the things that you don't accept and you can't accept. And so you won't accept. So you won't come off testosterone because it's really difficult to accept your body that you accept doing things that you might not accept completely bamboozling him for your body and I wasn't I was always prepared for it because I knew that the, the goal was more important than how I felt in the moment mm. but um well, yeah was not something I was looking forward to so when they told me I could stay on testosterone and just reduce the dose I was like ah oh, ah oh, yes. that's such a good gift <laughs> yeah He's so I'm really excited and thing. yeah hopefully my sister um, gets a baby happen. can I quickly ask you what's your book called so it's called Dear Cisgender People it comes out on the 6th of June, I'm climb fish. Um, it's, it's all of my knowledge in one place, it's the best way. Oh my god, it's literally five sides of A5. To put it, um, and I think I explore conversations in a way that haven't been explored. This is not your traditional trans book, if I'm honest, like, it's, 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 it's more than that, but I'll give you a bit of an insight to what I talk about in the book, so if you're excited, it's, it's available for pre-order on Amazon. I haven't even announced this to my followers, so you lot are the first ones in. But let me tell you a bit oh, about listen, what's Listen, Kenny, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to be a collaborator so you can share this on your page so your yeah. followers can hit it. <laughs> Thank you. But, um, so yeah, it's called Dear Cisgender People. Cisgender essentially just means non-trans, for those who don't know. <laughs> it's a cult. No. Um, and basically how the book is, it's like every chapter starts off with essentially a diary entry where I realised I was different, or what I wanted to talk about what I'm talking about in the book. And um, so the first chapter is called The Gender Begins Here, and it's a full exploration of gender, non-binary identities, cult like identity before Western culture, all those different. Did she just slip up and say cult-like? <laughs> Pre-Western culture. Oh, do you know, I reckon cavemen and hunter, hunters and gatherers and prevalent in... Um, Societies and cultures which are not very touched, you know, all across, all across uh, Africa and the Andes and uh, far flung places, Eskimos and everything, uh, the amount of non binary and gender fluid people will scare you. Scare you, it will. Things. Um, and one of the other chapters that I'm very proud about is Black and Trans, which is the oh. kind of crossover between being Black and Trans and having that intersectional identity and navigating essentially. Is that like Rachel Dozel? Because she's she was trans black. So I think what Kenny's talking about is she's done a whole chapter about that brave woman, Rachel, um, who is a uh, white woman who identifies as black. So 
I'm, I'm surprised that she would include that in her book, but I'm really pleased that she's included Rachel. She transphobia as well as racism, mm -hmm. um, as well as I'm bisexual. So oh it's a big, it's a massive factor. It's a I mean, massive I'm laughing factor. only because it's just too much. <laughs> like, um, it is a lot, but it's... I'm laughing because I I can't believe that I'm such a successful woman um, and I'm having to put myself through this. Just hilarious. Do you know what? The thing is, my writing is very, um, it's very warm. It's very friendly. I was just going to say, I can imagine yeah. how you write just from yeah. Yeah. you talk. Yeah. It's, I, can, it's... I can imagine how you write just from your, the grammar that you use when you speak literally how I speak now it's very open um but yeah there's wonderful in it there's one chapter called we have to protect the kids which is all about trans youth oh thank Christ for that thank Christ I was I was look many things have concerned me I, they haven't really talked about transitioning kids and they haven't really they haven't talked about that enough I was a little bit worried that they weren't going to you know protect trans youth and they were going to skip over that and they were just going to leave out the trans um by prox trans housing by proxy mothers predominantly who transition their children and um you know and boys and girls changing rooms and stuff i thought they were going to just gloss over that and exploring that conversation which i love to explore the gray i think that there's can so I, much can value I ask in the gray. yeah because like obviously there's been an explosion yeah. of trans trans kids and um i th think like what what some people say is that how can that suddenly have happened like yeah. davina do you mean what you say do you mean something that you asked rather than what some people say because some people say is you really asking a question isn't it that's what some people say mean is it is it what's your opinion on that yeah why there's essentially such a yeah. boom in people coming out yeah, yeah. Oh, honestly Davina, it's because of shit like this that you're doing this evening. That's why. It's because so many people that people trust, so much legacy media, so many people that you expect to ask questions to not go along with this utter shit have gone along with it. After this thing that you've done on Instagram, there will be more children susceptible to this crap. There will be more parents who think that, well, Davina said it, she must have looked into it. This moron has talked about it, so there must be some validity in it. That's why, because everybody was supposed to say no, everybody who was supposed to stand up for truth and reason and protect children just went, fuck it. That's why. More than anything, it's, you know, it's, you understand that trans people exist and trans is a thing, because it's like, like you know, so much of my life was me going, Oh, well, lesbian doesn't fit quite right, but I don't know what the word is. I mean. So I don't I understand what's happening. Exactly. So they know. Oh, just plain old homophobia then. Lesbian doesn't fit quite right. What, for a, a woman, a girl who fancies other females? Hmm. Could it be homophobia? Hmm. Yes, it really could. I know what the feeling is, but didn't have a label for the feeling. And all that, this kind of rise in trans like awareness has just given people the label to how they feel so essentially do you know what i mean it's just kind of like when you discover something like i don't know you're ill and then you hear a phrase and yeah all, you of, think, oh, all of it, that and yeah. like that's it oh like <laughs> like hypochondria something like that do you know what i mean it's the exact same thing i think that's happened i don't think there is um you know, a lot of people are like, it's a fad and all these different things. And I can understand why people might think that when you don't do the research and you see it on like a... Yeah, but when you do do the research, what you do is you think, oh, my daughter, she likes short hair. She wants to play football. Oh, my God. Is she a lesbian? Quick, let's tell her she's a boy. Then let's cut her tits off. Brilliant. Very like surface level. I can understand why you would make that assumption. But, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't think the numbers are anything to worry about. You know, another conversation alongside this is that, you know, trans youth are transitioning, medically transitioning specifically, which I tell you right now is not happening. Like even the waiting list that I told you earlier from 2008, yeah. even if you wasn't a youth by the time you got on the list, you're not getting seen. Darling, let me just say, kids is not dealing, is, is not the same people who are seeing kids. And actually what the government have done by closing kids, by closing the Tavistock, 
is they've sent it out to GPs who will be scared shitless not to um, give 16-year-olds puberty blockers and they'll be scared about their practice going to court. And let's face it, if you try and get a doctor's appointment at the moment, you can't get one. And if you do go and see a doctor, you usually see a bloody nurse and nobody can get an appointment. I have to go to my surgery at like 8 o'clock in the morning and queue outside in order to get an appointment, even if I'm half dead. So let me just say, they will be getting puberty blockers because the government haven't said no. No, The government have said, have said that there may be cases and parents have to go along with it. And they've totally, they've totally gone against what they should have done. Uh, they have been totally gutless. So, you know, oh, if you look up an illness and you might have an illness. Yes, it's called Munchausen's. Oh, I, I've got that. I've got that illness. It all makes sense now. I've I've got Google. Oh, apparently I've... Oh, I, I need to cut my ears off because I read somewhere that uh, I've got earwax. <laughs> so yes. you're an adult. So like, and, and you've got to think, even if it's not that, going to private healthcare providers and having the financial funds behind you to be able mm. to support it doesn't happen. And there is a protocol when you come out as trans um, as a young person and it involves a lot more safeguarding. It's a lot more of a longer procedure. There's a lot more therapy and conversation. Just for anyone who's decided to tune in because they're a fan of Davina, let me just say, once you socially transition a child, once you pretend that that child has is actually the opposite sex, once you say their body is wrong, um, as noted by Susan and Marcus Evans, uh, way back, like a decade or so ago, uh, the harm is done. So let me just say that. The harm is done. You're already on it. That, that child is already on a path. That's very, very difficult to get off. So don't, 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 don't listen to this bullshit here. Involved. It's not just, okay, we agree that you're trans. What, what, what is believed is that you have to believe that the young person is who they say they are. That's ultimately what yeah, the parents you're believe. Yeah, like um, if, if uh, uh, Angela, uh, who's 12, like says, look, I am Colin's wife and Colin's like 56, uh, you do have to believe that that child is exactly who they say they are. That's how we've always done it in this country. Um, that's why we have, oh, I don't know, age of consent. Uh, that's why we have uh, the age of criminal responsibility. That's why um, we have uh, softer punishments in schools uh, rather than when you leave school and you go into a workplace and everything because so people know that children don't really know what they're fucking doing. And on the kid being yeah. honest. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. But then, you know, conversations are navigated to ensure that it is exactly what they say it is it is that they are trans and it's not something else so it's just making sure that you know this is this is how you feel and they're safe, that they're safe to cut their tits off yeah okay yeah just making sure they're they're safe to to take irreversible uh harmful drugs yeah mm, mm, yeah yeah just making sure that they're safe mm, yeah mm. You are safe, you know what I mean? It's mm. safe. And then, mm. you know, then it's socially transitioning, so it might be changing your name, yeah. um, dressing in a different way, where, you know, doing your nails. Like wearing trousers or maybe painting your nails um, and then you get your bollocks cut off. So just making, just making sure they're safe. Whatever it is, right? So there's a social transitional side. Yeah. And then, you know, if, if you want to move forward, you have blockers and all the testosterone and stuff that comes with mm. it. Mm. This just sparked a real memory yeah. with me with them um, when I worked at MTV. So this would have been, I started at MTV 32 years ago. So it would have been maybe two years after I started. So 30 years ago, I remember um, a, a, a boy um, changed their name to Mel. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, a girl, sorry, a girl changed her name to Mel, mm -hmm. but as a man Mel. And we will just started calling him Mel and that was it like from one day to the next and in, I guess because we were at MTV that is exactly the same much, isn't it pretty much at MTV it was like anything went you know like you were rocker you were soul you were heavy metal <laughs> you were a rocker you were soul you were heavy metal uh you pretended to be a woman you got your breast cut off and pretended to be a man like anything um anything goes uh you know some people like bros some people got their breasts cut off, it, you know, anything, anything. So you were like, like, you nobody kept like man, woman, gay, straight. It was very, and in fact, even like race, like nobody cared about anything. Like, whereas now, now Kenny's got a whole chapter about race, but 
32 years ago, nobody really cared. Ah, oh, it's funny, Davina. It's almost like all the information that you need to make a really good, solid um, opinion about this stuff. And I feel that you're not going to. Where you were from. It was such an amazing melting pot at the time. It felt all very, very accepting. But I'd forgotten about that. Mm. Yeah. But that's the way it should be. This is, this is people. This is person. <laughs> is that what your book's called? This, this is, is gender. Yeah. This this is, is, yeah, it's just gender people. This is gender people. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> um, but what you're, Kenny, what you're talking about is really important in terms of and I, and I think I want to bring this up because, yeah, yes, I, good. I, it's my experience. So prior to kind of the raising trans rights, um, the level of discrimination and transphobia was so low. Like, I would barely be on the receiving side of transphobia because people... Because people didn't care until you little Knox decided to force us all to pretend that you were really the sex that you're not. It's specifically men. Because men don't give a shit about men who pretend that they're, about, about girls pretending they're men. But women do care about men in our spaces, Kenny. Didn't really discriminate against it. It was just kind of like, no, oh, okay, you're trans. Really... But that's exactly what it felt right. like then. Exactly. Nobody but, cared. Right. And it was very much like, we don't care. I don't really get it. And, you know, I don't have to get it. I just, I, I love that you are who you are. Yeah. And that's as simple as it is. And that's where we left it. And then what's happened with the, the rising conversation about trans stuff, especially in the media. Because you came for the children. You put rapists in women's prison. You came for our children. You flooded this shit into our schools. You started puberty blocking young children in this country. You started taking the fucking wombs out of children as young as like 13, 14 in the United States of America. You started slicing off the breasts of minors that's what happened it's got absolutely nothing to do with anything else you were fringe little people that everyone thought was a little bit freaky didn't really understand it but but mostly you were left alone but now kenny you're coming for the kids you're promoting top surgery to very confused and vulnerable girls who 20 years ago would have been anorexic or had bulimia that's why it's a big issue for us. Um, where, you know, there's fear-mongering tactics involved mm. and they use dog-whistling tactics, essentially using certain words like to women. aggravate people in the trans community, but Adults also they use female. words that in your memory will connotate and um, with connotate. something negative. So, like, a lot of the trans... Fucking hell. Connotations, they will connotate. Titles, for instance. So, and then also, I, I talk about this in my book. It's one of the chapters about media. Mm. Um, but essentially, a lot of what the media is trying to do is to, to push you to one side or the other. And I think that's with the rise of social media as well. It's very much become you're either left or right. And there's no space for in between. Mm. And I hate that because I don't think but that. I think so many people are in that in between. Mm. Like there are a lot of very, very moderate people who just want to kind of all get on. Who just want to give away some of women's rights. You know, there's a lot of people who are quite privileged, live, live a relatively cosseted life and and have nice houses and can go to nice gyms and and um and really don't give a shit what happens to women who have few choices. They don't care about the women that have lost their jobs. They don't care about women in rape crisis centers who have to share with men. They don't care about women in prison who have to share with rapists. They you know there's there's so many of us in the middle that really really don't care about anybody else. Like <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's but I that's agree with you. Bad. I agree with you. It gets fueled, right? Yeah, and it's it, it becomes <laughs> a nasty discussion. And there's a lot of research now that's saying that you know has a detrimental effect on trans youth specifically. Yeah, there's a, there's a detrimental effect for kids that want to go to school and cosplay being the opposite sex. Other kids are just not fucking having it. Oh, what a oh my god! What you mean? You mean that when people tell the truth? Some kids that live a lie then get bothered about it. Oh, my God. That's it's just it's unfathomable. I talk to women. Let me just say, I talk to women all the time who are feel gaslit and isolated on the basis that they cannot speak the truth. Sometimes in their own bloody homes.
typically. And even myself, you know, being in this world, I, you know, I have to stay up to date with, you know, what's going on with trans rights. And more than my heart breaks for trans youth, because mm -hmm. as someone who's been transitioned for a long time, made peace with myself and, you know, knows that some of the stuff out there is... I made peace by my, with myself by taking synthetic hormones and cutting my breasts off. Uh, totally accepted myself. It's so much big information mm -hmm. because I've done research versus seeing it as a young person, being like, oh my God, is this true? Struggling with, you, you know, how you feel in yourself and maybe the sport you're experiencing and, you know, trying to go to school and like, you know what I mean? Trying to talk to your family. It's such, it's such a harder time to be a trans person. And I right? think at the same time, what's really hard is young people are on social media so much. They're on TikTok so much. And also sometimes, equally, I'm sure that, you know, obviously in the, the media are, are very kind of polarised about it. But then also there are people within your own community, like there are some trans people who are very polarised about it as well. Yeah. And if you get in the wrong algorithm, you are constantly being fed fear and anger. When if you went to another algorithm, you know, you'd come across you who's a lot more balanced. And is like she nearly gets it, people. <laughs> she nearly gets it. If you're in one algorithm, you could be sucked right into the cult. Uh, you could think top surgery is um, just some sort of euphemistic, like, lovely thing that happens. You could not understand that top surgery is deep incisions that cut off healthy breasts. Um, you could think that testosterone is completely harmless and that puberty blockers are reversible if you get into one algorithm. Um, but if you get into the other algorithm, you might be told the truth, which, which is really, really hurtful, where you learn that actually human beings are not plants. Look, well, come on, let's all come together. Let's all kind of fight for our cause. Let's educate. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's such a, it, you know, if you start following anger or fear, then it just yeah. perpetuates and you just yeah. get served more and more, which Literally. exacerbates everything. And that's, yeah. Yeah, I think that's why there's a lot of, you know, there's a, you know, transphobia is what, like five times what it used to be over the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah, because it's not because you've shoved it down our throats, is it? That's not why. It's not because we found out about rapists in women's prison. That's not why. That's not why. None of that's why. It's nothing to do with you kids uh, poisoning every single place that you go and forcing people to submit to the cult. It's not that at all. It does mean old truth tellers. 2018. And so, and I, yeah, I do, I do blame the media for a lot of that, that polarizing mm. conversation. Mm. Also, you know, only ever talking about trans people from a very specific frame of reference, like, mm. oh, trans youth having surgery or, you know mm. what I mean? Like even my friend, for instance. Uh, note that Kenny, she has very carefully left out some of the genuine concerns. So trans youth having surgery, that is not the news in the UK. What is the news in the UK? Rapists in women's prisons. What is the news in the UK? Woman getting her surgery cancelled because she complained about a man pretending to be a woman, that women are being sexually assaulted on female only, only wards, um, that you can't even say that a woman is an adult human female, that women are losing their jobs. That is the news. It's, it's very, I mean, I don't know. When was the last time there was a story about a uh, minor having surgery in the UK in our newspapers. They're, those aren't the stories, but that's that's a total lie edit um, by that woman. This is Charlie Craig. She did a, a show for BBC and they called it DIY Teens. And remember what I was saying earlier about what you refer to the word? Like, what what do you think about when I say the word DIY? What's the first things that come to um, mind? Fixing things. Okay, but like, do you have a particular... Oh. What's the, what, what is it that you think when I say that? Oh, fixing things. Yeah, but... Uh... Vision of how, who the person is fixing it, their education level of fixing that thing. Would you say no. that they're smart? He does. Would you say that no. they're not? No. I don't know. I do see DIY as a skill, but I would say like it's a, it's a kind of building, um, changing things. Um... Davina's really trying here to try and work out what it is that this self-absorbed woman is actually wanting her to say. But do it yourself is in itself. It means do it yourself. Right. Do it yourself, exactly. But usually when you're doing that and you're saying that in a medical way... Well, it's, it's, it's 
sounds like people are just trying to change themselves on their own without any medical help or anything. It sounds a bit chaotic. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you it's already... Not, it's not complimentary. <laughs> Finally, exactly. Right, exactly. And that's my exactly. point. It's the way that these outlets are phrasing things specifically yeah. with certain people. Because my thing was when I, when I asked myself the same question, I was like, when DIY comes to me, what do I think of? And I'm like, I usually feel of a white builder that usually has a builder's bar. A white builder that has a builder's bum, has a penis. I often think about a builder having a penis, like being cis, having a having a penis, um, not having uh, breasts. Um, I often think about them topless, um, maybe with a hard hat on. Um, definitely only white men do any DIY. Uh, I would never think, even as a black woman, I would... I would never think that anybody of any color could could actually build do any DIY. Um, definitely a penis. Did I say penis? I I wanted to say penis. Um, crack that you know does have a skill set, but doesn't have a like a you know an elevated skill set. And so I think it's about the connotation, and the media relies a lot on that. Um, in <laughs> the media relies on a lot of the thing that nobody actually thinks when people say DIY. In order to you know, essentially get away with saying that they're, because, you know, they're, they're journalists and they're meant to be balanced in what they say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they have to do things in a more creative way in order to basically not get done by like Ofcom or whoever regulates them as a platform. So, yeah, it's... it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, I'll tell you what this person's doing. It's called trans conversation. It's when, <laughs> it's when you actually have a conversation, but you, you really do say absolutely nothing at all. It's called transversation strong world out there it's like mm. you have to know you have to educate yourself you need to understand these things otherwise you miss them mm. can i just say because I, I know we're nearing the end of our time but thank i just want to say right. thank you so much thank i really you. um i love that i loved our chat and i hope i loved our chat i liked i uh the bit i liked is is the lies um is the uh weird uh place that you tried to take the conversation um the misrepresentations uh, and I, I just want to thank you because I, I hope that what this has partially achieved is that all the TRAs that piled on me when I said that nice comment will, will now think that I am really, under, oh my God, so understanding. If, you know, um, my followers or whoever comes across yeah. this yeah. will learn something and, um, yeah. and spread, spread the news and the love. And spread the news. If it looks like your daughter's going to cut her hair, maybe she's not interested in boys, cut her tits off. That's all right. Here's some questions. And the inclusivity. Um, oh, do you have time I've for actually got to go. <laughs> um, and I love you. But I'll tell you what we can do, yeah. um, Kenny, is that I, why don't we say now, if you've got any questions... Yeah. We're both going to post this on our pages. Yeah. Ask down below. Kenny's going to look at my page and maybe yeah. answer some questions. And I will also answer questions. Yeah. No. Um, and yeah. and uh, come back when you have all of your womb and everything removed. Um, and we can talk about the menopause. Um, I'm really looking forward to you going through that uh, in your mid-30s. Amazing. I just want to say out loud... If anybody posts anything that is just willfully cunty, and when I say cunty, I mean it in the old... Oh, my God. Oh, I feel so dysphoric. She said cunt. I feel so dysphoric with that word. Um, it makes me think about female bodies, and I just... Oh, uh, I can't. I feel... I, I, I just can't. I probably shouldn't have said that word. Um... Absolutely, you know, we won't block any questions. We'll we're really open and inclusive of any questions that come and comments that come, and we we won't delete any, and we'll really engage with all of these. Go and have a look at our Instagram. Fashion sense of the word, not the new trendy sense of the word, which actually is quite flattering. If anybody's arsy, um, I am going to delete your comment. I'm sorry, I don't normally do this, but I will. Oh, are you? It's, it's, what you don't normally do it. And you're predicting, you're predicting that people will be not very happy with this. Um, ass kissing, this dishonest ass kissing, this kneeling to the cult, this giving up your head.
Thank you. No, I think that's yeah. important. Like, yeah. I don't I, want any hatred or nastiness anyway. Or questions. So, um, or I'm dissent. gonna delete it. Or resentment. Um, well, thank listen, you. Yeah, so, Kenny, I love I'm you. I'm so grateful right now. Like, honestly, and yeah, just for it to be you. Do you know I've loved you since Big Brother. So like, this oh. is like a childhood dream, like come true for me. And <laughs> also, I've just I've always thought that you are such an incredible interrogator of conversations and interrogator interrogator interrogation means inquiring like deep answers that require good questions that investigate that wasn't that what that was i know words mean fuck all to these people but jesus a change maker and so just having someone like you share their oh, time with thanks is incredible so thanks. i love you as well. thank you i love you too all right Soon. Yeah. Oh God, that was so awful. My hair's gone flat. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, I think it was really, uh, very important. I quite like watching that with you. Um, I mean, she just said she's deleting questions and comments. So, uh, uh, I don't know what to say. I just want to say again, prior to this. Uh, I genuinely thought uh, Davina would, especially with this stuff on menopause, would really, really understand. Um, and addiction and self-loathing and the experience she had in childhood and the trauma that she had in childhood, that she would have some understanding that this is bullshit. Um, that she would have some understanding that promoting this to her followers would be really, really irresponsible. Um, and that encouraging just one more girl to go down the road of testosterone and also like not saying about early menopause and what menopause can bring and the, the stuff about testosterone and her taking a little bit and making it really last while this woman is guzzling testosterone that would help women who aren't pretending to be something else just live a few more years without feeling absolutely dreadful. So, um, yeah, look. Uh, we have to continue to speak the truth, um, even when those that we formerly might have thought would to um, have just given up um, on the truth, it, find it too difficult to defend. Um, well, uh, if you remain one of those truly difficult, not pick me women, then I promise we will win. Uh, pop over to Instagram and make your feelings known. Um, and keep doing that every time someone does something like this. I, I just think, and I don't mean go over and swear and shout and be abusive. I mean, just go over and just say you're really disappointed. Um, because uh, I think that might have an impact. Um, and if you do that, I promise we will win. And do you know why else we're going to win? Because I never lose.